Hello and welcome to this, the 19th episode of Magic the Judging, where we help you to become a better judge. And uh, what we're going to talk about tonight mainly is, uh, is we're just going to answer the question, why? Why judge? Why do we need judges? Why do judges exist at all? Why am I one? And as uh, I'll, I'll give the announcement out of the way straight away, why am I no longer going to be one? Um, yes, that's, that's right, folks. I've, uh, as I've announced previously on the UK Magic Judge Forums, but maybe a surprise to some of uh, my viewers. Um, I'm hanging up the proverbial uh, zebra shirt. Um, sadly, it's proverbial because they actually changed it to black shirts, which I didn't like at all. Um, uh, I'm not going to be a Magic Judge any longer. I'm leaving the Judge programme. Um, there's every possibility I'll be back at some point, but I need an absolute clean break from it. So. That is the topic of tonight's stream. Like, why judge? Why do we have judges? And uh, like, what's been going on that's stopping me doing it uh, for now? Um, I'm being told that the judge stripes do in fact still exist in South Africa. You, you go, guys. Like, the judge stripes were the best. Don't get rid of them. Uh, the black shirts, yeah, I don't know, they're kind of cool. It's quite difficult when you look around at a random tournament to work out where all the judges are, because they're wearing black. And the players? They're wearing black, a lot of them. Never mind. That was one of the decisions that I will never quite fully understand, but uh, never mind. So, why judge? Um, first of all, um, I, I hope it's been obvious, um, as I've been doing this stream, uh, that one of the best reasons to judge is because it's actually pretty good fun. It is really good fun. Um, I hope, I think it's come across best, probably, in uh, those episodes where I'm uh, recounting tales from a PTQ I've just been to, or um, or a Nationals qualifier, or like, um, well, Magic Cup qualifier uh, that I've just been to, when I've come back from one of those tournaments, like a Grand Prix, and I get to tell you about all the stuff I did whilst I was away for the weekend. Um, I hope it's come across that I do absolutely have fun uh, at tournaments, um, because it's a, you know, it's a very important thing about like what, what's the point of judging. Some people find it surprising that it is fun. Um, there's a heck of a lot of mental exercise going on. Um, magic is a ridiculously complex game. And being on top of it enough to be able to explain to other people how the game works. Uh, people that have been playing the game probably for years themselves, but still don't quite have some kind of concepts under, under their skin, like in their blood, and will always get confused about certain things. Um, they need us. They need us to be able to play legitimate, sanctioned magic uh, the way that it's supposed to be played. Um, the number of stories I've heard where people thought that Lanoir Elves was amazing because you play your Lanoir Elves and it says tap, add green to your mana pool. I don't know what a mana pool is. Oh, I've got land. They make mana. That must be my mana pool where all the land is. So add green to my mana pool. That must mean I search my library for a forest and put it into play. I tell you what, under those kind of rules, Dark Ritual is amazing. Start the turn with, like, start the game with four swamps in play. One to play the, uh, one to play the ritual, and then three off the ritual. Wow, that'd be great. Sadly, it doesn't work like that. And to keep everyone on the same page, we need judges. So, rules knowledge is a, is a very important thing. Um, and I hope I've done my fair share of the work in uh, educating the judge circle and judge candidates um, on rules. Um, some of the rules streams I've done with the examples I've put over um, as I've been going through topics, I, I've been quite proud of them. I've been very happy with the way that they've come across. And uh, I think, well, basically, I, I saw a bit of a hole. I saw that people's rules knowledge wasn't being exercised quite as well as people's policy knowledge was. And I thought, right, well, I'll hit this. I saw pro players streaming live drafts to get people, help people get better at drafts. I saw people like playing constructed matches and, and taking people through, oh, yeah, this is why I built the deck, and then here's how it actually plays, and talking about the decisions they're making from turn to turn. Uh, I just saw pros doing this and thought, well, the streaming can't be that hard if you can stream and play um, at the same time. Uh, I saw Day Nine streaming some um, uh, some StarCraft matches and talking about them at the same time, and I, I just kind of put two and two together and thought, why not do this for judging? 
Um, I started with the rules because it's it's one of my strongest areas, and I believe I'm, I'm relatively good at explaining uh, rule the concepts to other people. Um, I knew I wanted to start off strong with state-based actions because everything involves state-based actions. Like it's it's so difficult to talk about anything in magic without having state-based actions kind of backing you up. Um, yet it's so difficult to talk about state-based actions because in the abstract they kind of don't mean much. It, it, like, it's like you know they're going to be important. Um, it's a little bit like learning... Oh, I was going to say it's a little bit like learning algebra so you can go on and learn calculus. It's like, except algebra is useful in its own right. But you, you know what I mean. Like you, you have... You have a kind of a, a stepping stone thing. You've got to learn this, even though it's, it's not going to make any sense to you to start with. But once you use it and go, boom, now you've done all this, you can you can get up here and you now understand what that stepping stone was all about. Um, that's what I think about state-based actions. and That's why uh, I put them on those streams. So why judge? Um, it's because, one reason is because it's mentally really quite rewarding to see uh, a very complex game being played out and realize that actually you understand it and people ask you for help um it's a, it's a really good feeling being asked to help and being able to help and having somebody who approached you with a problem go away with a solution and go oh i wasn't so bad after all i'm glad i involved a judge there um of course those great problems and solutions don't uh limit themselves to magic rules the problem could be, you know, my opponent's done something a little bit shady. So we need fairness in a tournament. Um, and, I mean, who, who better than an independent judge to decide on matters of fairness? And you, you've seen them all over the place. Um, in the Olympics, uh, which are on at the moment, which uh, some of you might not realise because you're here watching me on a judge stream um, rather than watching any of it. But I don't know. I don't even know what's on tonight. But you look at the pardon me, you look at the Olympics and um, there are judges that need to make split second calls on um, decisions in fencing. Um, you've got hockey judges that have to determine whether a foul was enough just to earn you a hit or whether it's going to earn you a green card and a, a two minute exclusion or like even further. You've got the badminton referees who had to make a really tricky call about whether to show the black card to a team to um, disqualify them for not trying their best to play a tournament. Controversial ruling, maybe in in terms of like the general public's knowledge of badminton, but like within the sport, you can see they've got they've got guidelines laid out of what rules the players must play by and what infractions exist and how you deal with players who are not uh, meeting their um, uh, responsibilities, not like playing to the responsibilities that you've given them, um, and you know they they learn their policies, learn their philosophy, and came to the decision to disqualify some people from the Olympics. But they didn't do it in a biased manner. They did it because they are the arbiters of their sport. There's no one better to decide on that issue. I wouldn't trust it to the commentators or the journalists or the spectators or the players to come up with that decision of showing a black card to a badminton pair and having them um, disqualified. I'd leave it to the referees because that's what they're there for um and yeah it's again it's it's a it's a good feeling that you can see something happen and you have a philosophy guiding you that tells you well we want magic to be played in a certain way we have these infractions that you can commit which have kind of prescribed um solutions to them but it's nice to think like outside the box a bit and think around, think of the infractions that like that don't exist, or try to work out um, what can go wrong before it even goes wrong. It, it's quite a different skill set. Um, I found that um, as I got better at judging, I got far far worse at playing, um, which you know some people have described as the, the judge's curse. Um, in a way, it's, I think it's because I actively think differently about a magic game uh, than I used to um, obviously I used to be th thinking about how I could win a game when you sit down and play that's kind of what you're trying to do you're looking at the cards you go I can do this and then they might do this and I can do this and they might do this so or oh, we're in a bit of a race here I might win the race 
when I'm looking at a match these days, I'm going like, huh, he's got Augur of Bolo, uh, Bolas in his hand. Um, Augur of Bolas has you look at the top three cards of your library and reveal an instant of sorcery. Um, I can see that he might not reveal a card off of that. I should be paying attention to that. Um, I can see that there's a legendary land in play. This is like back in Kamigawa, this was happening all the time. I can see there's a legendary land in play. I'd better watch out just in case um, a, a second legendary land uh, gets played. Uh, I can see there's a whole bunch of pump effects in play. So I'm trying to work out what the exact power and toughness of everything in play is so that when combat happens, I know it's been resolved properly. All of these kind of things. I can see Thalia on the table. So I know everything costs one more. And I know that players forget that a lot. Or um, in uh, Alara uh, block constructed um, at Pro Tour Barcelona, I knew people would miss the fact that Restoration Angel can't bounce another angel. Um, players miss that very easily. Um, but like that's what we're there for. As soon as Restoration Angel gets played, just have that one think. Like, oh, there's a target. What's the target in Angel? So, I mean... Coming back to the idea of like why judge, it it gives you a completely different look on a game of Magic. Now, it's somewhat sad in a way that it I think it's actually made me worse at playing Magic because um, I it's like I'm out of practice at thinking turns ahead to work out what my plan should be as I'm playing. Um, I'm sure there are players, there are examples of players who have kind of crossed over into being judges and have quite happily put, um, kept both up. Um, and to be honest, this kind of slide uh, didn't really happen until I was like a level three, uh, a level three judge, which kind of brought with it the idea that maybe I wouldn't play in Grand Prix that much anymore. Because if I was going to go to a Grand Prix, I may as well be judging it because, you know, you get low, you get quite a lot of boosters for judging at a Grand Prix. You get the boosters, the foils, you've got to offset the cost of traveling. It's very expensive to play in a Grand Prix. If you, if you think about like how much it would take for me to get off the Isle of Wight, get to Paris, say, um, or Lyon was one that I did go to, um, book a hotel, and then pay the entry cost of the Grand Prix. Adding that up, you know, it, it makes a, a certain amount of a dent in your wallet to do that. When one alternative is to apply to try to get some of that sponsored, and even if you don't get any sponsorship for that, actually work, work part of the event, um, or all of the event, and get rewarded in boosters and foils, which from which you can make up your travelling expenses. Um, that leads me to another answer of like why judge. Well, I mean, I've been to some amazing places. I've like I've been to um, I've been to Rome for the World Championships. I've been to Memphis, um, New York for the World Championships. I've been to uh, Turin for Grand Prix. Grand Prix, sorry. Um, uh, Madrid for a Grand Prix, uh, Berlin for a Pro Tour, San Juan for a Pro Tour, um, where I got my level three at. I've been to Kuala Lumpur for a Pro Tour, the one that um, John Finkel won the the top eight draft, didn't he? Um, like that. This is an amazing experience. Like I got sent to Kuala Lumpur to judge a Magic tournament, and I didn't have to pay for much, if any, of it. And um, I sold, um, if I remember rightly, I, I sold all my judge foils at the event um, to a trader there, took the money, went next door to um, like a consumer goods um, centre, uh, bought a digital camera, brought that home, and I'm pretty sure we still even use that digital camera. It's so, like the the compensation for doing a good job, it, it's worth it. It's, it's up there. It, it makes it possible to do things that you otherwise probably wouldn't even consider. I would never go to Kuala Lumpur on my own budget. Um, I don't. I just. I don't. How could I even afford to um, like to save up that kind of money? It's mental. So I'm very, very grateful to what the Magic Program's done um, for me. Um, another answer: Why judge? Personal development is absolutely massive. Absolutely massive. One of the things that I get called on to do when I go to a Grand Prix is be a team leader. So I didn't like I didn't just get dumped there with a hey you're leading a team now. 
as I started to come up the levels in the judge programme, I was on teams. Um, as I got to be a confident member of a Grand Prix team, I thought, okay, I don't need to think much about what I'm doing. Like, sure, I'm on a deck check. I'm on the deck checks team. I know how deck checks work. Brilliant. So I got an opportunity to observe my team leader and think, how is he leading this team? How is he making this team get the job done? How is he making sure everyone has fun? How is he contributing to their development as a judge? Um, and it made me think, like, oh yeah, you know, I, I can probably do this. I I can see what they're doing. This works out pretty well. As I moved up the levels, and I started to be called on to do things like team leader nationals, like team leader Grand Prix. I managed to head judge nationals, which I was immensely proud of. Um, and I really do. As a aside, I hope I do not turn out to be the uh, the last head judge of a British national. So I, I, I hope that program comes back because it was awesome. Um, the the WMCQs are, are not a replacement for nationals in any way at all. Um, I would love to see where where Wizards take that program next, but I'd love to. I, I would love there to be a focus like in the British Magic calendar. If it's not a nationals, like with qualification to worlds, I may I don't maybe care so much. If it's an independent TO running some kind of convention that lasts a couple of days and there's magic everywhere and it's the focal point of, of the magic community, like that, that's what I would miss about Nationals. Um, but yeah, I got that, those experiences of um, being a team leader, leading people, inspiring people, hopefully. I mean, I tried. I don't know if I inspired anyone particularly. Um, I've been told that I have a bit, so yeah, that's got to be good. I, I don't think they'd be lying. Um this was happening to me at the same time as in my career as a computer programmer, um, I was being called upon to um, uh, to lead teams of programmers, um, which is an entirely different prospect in some senses, in that when you team lead at a GP, you're probably leading a team of people that you may not have met, like at least half of them, um, unless you've been to lots of GPs. So getting instant responses from somebody um, on the very day that you meet them, like you introduce them as the team leader, you take that team leader role up and like, bam, there's no question about it. I am your team leader rather than, uh, I don't know, being introduced to somebody and have them thinking, well, he's not very good. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't respect him as a, as a team leader. Um, so you, I, I mean, sure, team leading at work, which is like, it happens over a long period of time and you, you have a, a you have time to build up a personal relationship and you have time to fix things that go wrong and you have time to screw up things that have gone right. Um, it's a bit of a different prospect to team leading where it's like, hi, I'm your team leader, we're doing this today. We are, we've are, got to do it now. This is our jobs, here we go. Now you get help with it because the first kind of meeting you have as a team leader would be like a, the team leaders meeting, which is where all the team leaders get together and the head judge assigns out what he wants to have happen, like what kind of philosophy is guiding this tournament um, what kind of things is the head judge worried about what kind of things is the head judge not worried about and that again it's, it's that example of you you have a guiding philosophy that takes you through the rest of the weekend and if like if the head judge is hammering home like i need people to do reviews reviews is something i'm really passionate about then you know you get to your team leading and it's it's quite difficult in your team leader meeting then uh, not to remember to go, uh, oh yeah, reviews, head judge says about reviews, uh, we should probably do something. Um, so yes, magic has been absolutely uh, important in my career because I got that taste of of judging, of team leading, um, or of being that one step higher. When I head judge nationals, of course, I had team leaders underneath me and, and they led other judges. So having like two steps up the pyramid. So I wasn't the middle man anymore, I was the top. Oh, yes. Um, that that came in very, very handy when it came to being a, a, a team leader in my career. Um, different skill set. I wasn't telling people how uh, magic rules worked, but I was reviewing their code and, and saying, well, hey, you know, as a programmer, we don't normally do this kind of thing. Uh, what you've done works and the compiler accepts it, so, like, sure. But it's better if you do it this way because it's more readable later. Like, when you come back to this code in six months' time, you're going to understand what's going on. I won't bore you with programming details. I'm, I'm sure um, the non-programmers out there would absolutely hate it, and the programmers probably 
will reject half of what I say anyway. But um, I think you see the point. Um, magic judging, for me, has been a, a huge source of personal development. I, I have grown as a person from being uh, in part of the system. Um, and um, uh, it, 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 it's been utterly like invaluable in that sense. But you know, I've I've got to where I want to be now. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that going up even higher would be something I'd want to do right away. Um, it would kind of scare me, to be honest. Le level four and five of the judge program um, kind of freaked me out a bit. It kind of gets to the point, I imagine, as if you were like owning your own company, um, which is one of those like really risk-based things because people start to look up to you not just as like a respected member of the community but the actual leader of the community or like a, a demigod or something i mean the kind of um the, the kind of respect people showed for um like sheldon menory before he retired i mean it, it was just kind of epic you you meet the guy um and people who are meeting him for the first time are just like jaw dropped i can't believe i'm meeting you kind of celebrity that would um yeah, that would totally freak me out. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy with where I got to. I, I quite enjoy my level. Um, so I think I've answered a few of the reasons of why we judge. I haven't necessarily answered why, like, from a tournament organised perspective, why do you even need judges? Well, I mentioned about fairness, and I mentioned that, you know, the, the best person to ask to rule on a, a complex situation is one who's going to know their stuff, going to have experience as a judge and probably comes into a tournament knowing what might go wrong, but can also like coordinate the tournament, um, make it run to time. Um, if, you're, if you're a store owner, you quite possibly have a member of staff in that tournament because you're in a shop. So that member of staff is running the tills or something and you're probably paying them an hourly wage. If you've got a judge, a competent judge who will make sure that tournament like runs to time, you can be literally saving money over keeping your shop open like hours later than it needs to be. Um, that's probably not a massively strong argument, to be fair, but it, it's just one of those things. Like players are happier if the tournament's over quicker. Um, it, it sounds a bit strange. Like you don't have players turning up to the tournament saying, "Oh God, I wish I was at home already." But there's a very big difference between seven rounds of Swiss taking seven hours and seven rounds of Swiss taking nine hours because stuff's gone wrong, stuff's going too slow, that kind of thing. And judges can make that difference. Um, scorekeepers can make that difference as well. Uh, Wizards event reporter crashing can make that difference. But um, oh yeah, you, you see where I'm going at. Your players can be happier if a tournament's well run because, well, those are the those people who didn't quite make it for the top eight. Well, at least they do get home, I don't know, whilst it's still light. They're, they're not driving massively tired. It's safer. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons why having a judge at your tournament is a fantastically good idea. Um, there's been some interesting developments in terms of compensating judges, at, um, especially at the PTQ level, where Wizards used to give a set of boosters and say, look, this is, these are the boosters that you should be giving to your judge. And so TOs would just hand them on and that's fine. Uh, that seems to have gone away. Um, leaving TOs to kind of sort out their own judge compensation. Um, and, well, with the price of boosters generally going up, a lot of them are, are asking, why do we pay our judges so much? Um, it's a it's an interesting thing that, uh, it's an interesting topic that, you know, needs analysing from many different angles. Um, but I, I want to kind of put it to you, as, as a player, have you noticed the difference between a well-run PTQ with a, a head judge that knows what they're doing um, and like a local tournament that doesn't have uh, a higher level judge, doesn't, doesn't have an experienced judge. Um, can you feel the difference when you're playing? If you think that's worth it and bearing in mind that that judge may well have to travel some way to get to the tournament, um, I, I think, I mean... <laughs> It's difficult to say this in an unbiased fashion because obviously I've been a judge for ages and I've very much enjoyed going to a PTQ, getting a box of boosters for it and like drafting those boosters out with friends afterwards or something. Um, it's difficult for me to say in an unbiased fashion that our, us judges are absolutely worth a box of boosters for the day. 
Um, but, I mean, look at the tournaments you've been to that have been poorly judged. And, I mean, try to work out, is, is our experience worth anything at the end of the day? Um, the last um, Cardiff PTQ that I went to, um, for example, the two um, the two level one judges, well, one passed his level two at, on the day. Uh, the two level one judges there got half a box of boosters each, and I got full box. But the TO also paid um, travel expenses for me. So it's a different way of tackling it. Like he he wanted receipts for travel expenses and paid that. Um, other TOs will completely ignore travel expenses and just go, well, here's a box of boosters. Um, you know, your travel expenses come out of that. Or uh, a lot of people will give a box and a half to the head judge. Um, I, like I say, I got a box plus travel expenses. I'm more than happy with that. It's true. It's going to be more true going forwards as a judge that you, you have to justify your existence in a sense. You have to justify why the TO needs you on staff, um, why he's got to dedicate a certain amount of his boosters to you and not put them in the prize pool for the players or keep them for himself and just make more profit on the tournament. Um, so I think it's worthwhile sitting back and thinking, well, hang on, why do we have judges at tournaments? Why, why me? Um, why am I worth it? And just, yeah, it's worth thinking about. It's definitely worth thinking about. Um, so I think I've covered why I judge. Um, some very good reasons for why judging um, has been fantastic for me and why it has every possibility of being fantastic for you as well. Um, I've covered a bit of why TOs need judges and why they need to pay judges. Uh, basically, paid judges are going to be better than, than unpaid ones. I think that's always going to be the case. We are volunteers, in a sense, and we do do a lot of what we do out of like sheer love for the Magic programme. But um, I, I realise I'm a bit of a special case in that I'm on the Isle of Wight and leaving the Isle of Wight is particularly awkward. But you've got to motivate me to get out of my house and to your tournament and help you run it and help you make money out of it. Bottom line, I need some reason to be going to a tournament. Um, initially, I have to admit that um, the reason was a, a long way. It was to do with my my play group, as it were. Um, I moved to Bath, um, having kind of just been introduced to Magic. Um, it did a lot for me. I'm really grateful for being involved in Magic when I moved to Bath, because one of the first things I did was... Um, get in touch with the local like Magic mailing list and say, hey, I, I want to come play some Magic, is that cool? And uh, But I needed a lift from where I, where I lived at the time. Turns out there was another guy who lived in the same village, gave me a lift to Magic. He was giving me lifts to Magic. We were travelling together for years after that. We went to all sorts of Magic tournaments together, and he's been a, a great friend. I made loads of friends in Bath through Magic that I'm still in touch with, having moved away from Bath. Um, absolutely... Uh, grateful to well the judge program the magic uh, magic organized play program existing for just giving me that link like i moved to bath i didn't know anyone and i just had one kind of olive branch as it was to say hey i wonder if anyone plays magic and that just got me going um in that place um then it, it was quite it was quite easy to run an fnm group um back then fnm didn't have to be friday so we played it on wednesdays so, but we, we got the group running and people would ask about competitive tournaments and I'd know stuff because I'd been to competitive tournaments and I could tell people like, yeah, you don't, you don't have to be worried about a PTQ. I mean, like, hey, I'm going to be judging it. You know me. So like, just like I judge your FNM here, I judge PTQ roughly the same way. OK, I admit there's a couple of things that are different. Um, your opponents are going to be slightly more douchey, but... Uh, uh, you get penalised a little bit harshly for some simple mistakes, like draw two cards together accidentally, you're probably going to lose the game straight away. But I think I was able to put a much friendlier face on the PTQ scene than it might have appeared if you like went to FNM and you were kind of scared of the PTQ scene because it's this big competitive thing and people are going to punch your face and make your nose bleed or something, um, which absolutely doesn't happen, by the way. I've never seen that happen. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed the dynamic that built up there. I, I was running a play group. I was playing every week. Um, and instead of competing in the PTQs, 
I went and um, I judged. So I got some product for judging and I'd come back and I'd, I'd say to the guys, hey, who wants a free draft? Because so, I've got a box. We can do a draft. Um, we'll, we'll draft. We'll play with the cards. And you just give them all back to me afterwards. and That'd be cool. So I had a lot of fun opening my judge product. Um, there's nothing worse, I, I don't think, than having a box of boosters and just opening it, uh, opening booster after booster. I'm going, oh, yeah. nope, no planeswalker in that. Nope, nope, no ridiculous mythic sword in that. No, no. Absolutely brilliant invention drafting was because you can just like open packs and have fun with what you opened without worrying about what exactly was there or wasn't there. It was really good fun. Um, so now I need to I need to move into the the slightly sadder part of the stream and say why why is this my last stream? Why is this last stream of the series? Why am I leaving the program? Um. Basically, it's down to uh, it, it, it's down to demands on on time, on money, on holiday days, like how to book holiday from work and so on. Um, to put a, a long story short, um, my, my kids deserve a lot more of my time and, and my energy than I have been giving them. Um, partly because a lot of my time and energy has gone into magic. Um, somewhat strangely, I don't. I don't blame the stream series at all. Uh, coming online and talking about magic every Tuesday night was as much keeping me interested in the game as it was uh, a, a benefit to the rest of the community. Um, I've been, I, I really did plough myself at the beginning of the year into going to all sorts of tournaments, and I came out very tired from them, I have to admit. But also, I mean, more than that, doing like a foreign tournament every month for something like four or five months in a row um it it, it took quite a lot out of me and I, I realized that you know each of the big tournaments i was going to i'd have to book time off work to be traveling either side because you go to a gp well i probably need friday off to get there and i probably need sunday off uh, sorry monday off um to come back and i've only got limited holiday days and i can't use them all on magic so okay try and cut back a bit i will blame the isle of Wight a little bit i mean uh to get to a cardiff ptq I can just about get to Cardiff by 11 o'clock in the morning if I leave stupidly early from the island, but I can't really do it. So really, to even do a PTQ, I've got to leave Friday night. I've got to do the PTQ all day Saturday. And you know, in the case of the most recent Cardiff one, it really was all day Saturday. Um, finished after midnight, that one. Never mind. What did I say about judges making sure things run to time? Hmm. Um, and I was very, very grateful to get a, a lift off of a, a player, uh, Matt James, who was one of my best friends from Bath. Um, he gave me a lift back, let me crash at his, I could get up in the morning and get back home. But you know, I'm using so, so much of my weekend time to do a PTQ, and I'm slightly less involved in Magic than I was. I don't have a play group here that I'm, that I'm keeping up to speed. Um, in fact, I've been far more enjoying going to choir rehearsals and singing a lot. And that has demands on my time as well. But it's less demanding. I, I need to give it a Monday and a Thursday night so I can go to rehearsals. That's fine. That's never really been a problem. But how many weekends is the choir going to take away from me? Probably not any. Um, and the ones it does, there's going to be a Saturday evening where I've got to do a performance or something like that. But that'll be just the Saturday evening. It's not going to take me all weekend to travel to a tournament, do a holidays tournament, travel back again. And when you put it all together, um, I, I just don't think I can be a, a magic judge anymore. Um, I can't keep up the level I'm at. There's no way I could do that. And whilst I briefly considered like dropping down a level, say, um, like as in literally taking a star off, going down to level two and saying, look, okay, I'm not, an, I'm not, a, a, I'm not like an international judge anymore. I'm just going to try and like stick to the PTQ scene or something like that, stick as a floor judge, do that kind of thing. I think I'd hate it. Um, if you've ever done something, you've been good at it, you've, you've been kind of in the leading like stream and you, you step back and you're not quite as good anymore, you're not quite as sharp anymore. Um, some people can cope with that and I have massive admiration for them. Um, Ray Fong was a, a great example. He was a level three judge for a long time um, and he stepped down to level two partly because um, uh, he was working with Upper Deck um, Entertainment a lot, I believe. Um, and I had like massive respect to him doing that because, well, basically I just can't. I can't take a step down and not be the, like, the person I was. When, when I get involved in stuff, I get really involved in it. Um, 
and it annoys me when I uh, like I can't be involved to the to the extent that I want to be. So I've decided that no, I'm actually just cutting entirely. Uh, I'm not going to be a magic judge at all anymore. I'm not streaming anymore. Uh, I'm not going to be on the magic forums anymore. Um, I'll still technically be a judge, like until I've been inactive for about a year or so. And like I say, at some point, I may well be back. I've got children. One of them is male. Um, I realise there are female magic players about, but uh, there aren't that many. But, you know, my my little Todd might uh, stumble upon Daddy's old magic cards and go, oh, what are these? And, you know, I can teach him the game, and if he likes it, then I can take him down to FNM, and if he really likes it, we might be across to Southampton for a, a GPT or something. I don't know. I, I could see it unfolding that way. It's definitely a possibility. But for now, I'm uh, I'm going to be out of here. Um, I've got lots of people to thank. I wrote a big message on the UK um, Magic Judge Forum, so this wasn't going to be a massive surprise for everybody. Um, I thank a few people in that. Um, I need to say it absolutely again that um, Nick Sefton has been a, a massive inspiration. Um, and he's, I, I don't know... He crafted the judge program as it is today, as it exists in um, in the UK and Ireland and South Africa um, today. He, he's crafted what that judge program looks like. Um, it looks like it is because of him. He was a regional coordinator before the world realised they needed regional coordinators. He set up judge conferences before the world realised that judge conferences were a good idea. Um, he wrote communication policy into the Magic Tournament rules before the world realised that it needed a policy on how to um, get players to communicate with each other. So much innovation in the judge programme has come from that man, and um, yeah, it, it's been utterly amazing. Um, and if I get the chance to vote in the future on um, the Judge Hall of Fame, I will be definitely for voting for him if he's on the ballot. Um, I'm not quite... If I start to come to try to thank people who have had any kind of impact on me as a judge, then I'm undoubtedly going to miss some people. Um, so I'll apologise in advance for that. But going pretty much off the top of my head, uh, Ricardo Testatori has been an absolutely amazing inspiration as well. He's now a level five um, judge. He's reached the absolute top of the game. But he is possibly one of the only judges, um, certainly one of the level th uh, only like level three plus judges that I've met, that I've never been angry at, ever. Not even for the, a moment. Um, he's an absolutely fantastic guy to be around. I, if you ever get a chance to chat to him, then just do it, because he's such an amazingly calming influence. Um, possibly because of the way he talks. He's very slow, very measured, and wants you to understand what he's saying. Um, that's possibly how it kind of comes out. But yeah, he's um, an absolutely amazing judge. Um, I met him a lot of times because he came through to head judge British Nationals. Uh, it was at least two years in a row. I've got a feeling he did three, but I, I might be wrong on that. Um, and yeah, seeing... Well, part of my growth as a judge was when I saw these, these foreign judges. I didn't understand why an Italian judge came over to judge British Nationals, but I learned a lot from him. And I was really proud uh, when... I had judged nationals and we had a, a fully British team behind me. I thought, yeah, when I think a couple of years back to those those nationals where we had Falco Gores come over from Germany, we had Ricardo Testori come over from Italy, we maybe didn't quite have a full complement of um, of British judges that were that were quite able of taking our own nationals like by the scruff of the neck and giving it an amazing job in terms of running the tournament and developing judges that were there. Uh, and I feel we've got that now. Um, and again, so much of that development is down to Nick Sefton totally reviving the judge programme in the UK. Um, but, I mean, everyone has had a lot uh, of influence on me around the programme. Um, Kim Warren is the RC now. I was in contention for uh, taking over the RC. Uh, I'm very glad I didn't now because uh, it would be much harder to be making this decision if I was a regional coordinator. Um, so that's good. Um, but she has my absolute support for taking the judge programme forward. Um, I'm really impressed with what she's already done uh, being a regional coordinator. We've had a, a 
pretty massive um, influx in the number of level twos in the program, and that's partly been because she's she's got people on board. She's got David Life Smith on board with the new level two definition. And said, "Hey, chase these people up. Um, do do these things. Um, like get these people up to level two. They should be there." Um, she's been talking with all the level threes to say, "Hey, you know the definition of level two changed, right?" Um, we we have been holding them to too high a standard. We should be letting people through. We should be letting people in. Um, let's let's kind of work on changing that kind of thing. Um, so yes, she's put in an absolute massive amount of effort in the few short months that she's uh, been RC for. She is moving to France, but I don't see any reason why she can't continue to be regional coordinator from there. Um, as I said in the post that I made on the UK forums, it wouldn't be that much different having a regional coordinator that's um, sat in the Isle of Wight, or indeed um, in Ireland. Like, why does a small bit of geographical difference um, give you right such a problem? Um, there is an argument that says, well, if you've got a regional coordinator outside the country, that you are, in effect, snubbing the judges who are in the country and saying, hey, you know, you guys aren't good enough to have your own regional coordinator, so we need to give you a foreign regional coordinator. But to call Kim foreign is, is, is quite a stretch just because she's like moved over a option. Has she moved? Which will have moved over a small stretch of water. Um, so, yeah, I've absolutely got my support for Kim being RC. Um, I love the direction she's taking it in. Um, she's doing all the things that I would have done as RC, which is amazing. Right? We're, we're definitely on the same wavelength as far as that goes. Um, but she's done it with far more energy and kind of gusto uh, than I probably would have done. So, I think I have mentioned everyone and everything that I wanted to do. Um, the last thing I, I think I want to mention is about this stream. Um, it's Obviously, it's my last episode doing the stream. It's the 19th episode. Um, I'm very proud of having put 19 episodes together. Um, not all in a straight line. I realised I had weeks off in between and I, you know, I needed breaks. And A weekly schedule was pretty hard to keep up. Um, but I had to start off on a weekly schedule just to give me that motivation every week. Boom, here's a stream. Boom, here's a stream. Boom, here's a stream. Um, I often find that getting things started is, is the hardest step. Um, so I've been actually quite proud of myself in, in how the streams got together. I had the idea, hey, I'll see how this goes. I did it. I did a bit of a test stream. It worked. I just said, hey, I'm just going to sit and talk about state-based actions for a bit. I know I can do this at a judge seminar. I know I can go to a conference, give a seminar on state-based actions, and just off the top of my head, do it. So why can't I do that to um, a webcam and uh, record things for posterity, get them uploaded to YouTube later? That was an innovation that came later. Um, I absolutely have to thank Gareth Tanner for the publicity service he's been doing for me. Um, I have absolutely no... Uh, <laughs> I have absolutely no... Um, no doubt that there would not be as many people looking at this stream if it wasn't for Gareth continually, A, plugging it and telling people about it, and B, reminding me that it's Tuesday and that um, I should be streaming probably. Um, thank you very much for that. I, if, if I've been of help to you in the Judge Programme, Gareth, then, well, the, the help you've been back to me as well, you've more than deserved it. Um, there are lots of ways to take this stream on. I've been well impressed. Okay. I've got an iMac, so a lot of this is kind of built in. This this webcam is literally built into my monitor. There's a microphone. I don't even know where it is. Uh, it, it, it's in my monitor somewhere. And I've been using the Ustream producer software, to um, which is Ustream's own um, production software. They've got a studio and a pro version. I didn't need any of those. Um, what I what I have with the ability to like flick to card images and go, hey, Restoration Angel and then flick back to a camera and talk about it has been absolutely more than enough. Um, and it's been, uh, it's, to it's like totally a free version of this software. It's been a real kind of eye-opener in how well the basic tools worked. I haven't had to buy a fancy microphone. I haven't had to buy a fancy webcam. Like, it, they're just there. Um, so I put the bits together, and I did a stream, and it kind of worked. So I did it again, and more people started watching. And then we had the innovation of uploading stuff to YouTube and people have been looking at there. There's there's a lot of there's there's a lot of um uh I 
I don't know the word. A lot of support, kind of just for just for you get an idea out there and you just get it rolling. Get whatever momentum you can, and that momentum just carries you forward. That's why I, I struck a, a like a weekly um, a weekly stream because less than weekly would lose momentum so quickly. And that's been obvious recently where I've been having I've had stutters where I've had weeks I've had to miss for various reasons. Uh, and you could tell the, the excitement wasn't there. You didn't have a continuous um, stream of, of people going. Everybody who has cut, turned up to this stream and been there in the live chat talking to me, like it's there, it's right there on my screen. I'm reading the chat as I'm talking. I'm doing my thing, but I'm looking at the questions and I go, hey, I must have not mentioned state-based actions enough for this episode because someone's still talking about them. So I'll just mention state-based actions again. And like, I don't know, I've, I've been able to kind of bring that into the experience. Um, it's made each of my videos better, but it's also made me enjoy it. Um, I have also been known to tactfully ignore some of the questions that have been coming through in the chat. Um, I think I did eventually cover banding, so, ha. Huh? Um, but hey, um, you guys have been, um, you guys have been amazing uh, motivationally. I've really enjoyed doing this stream. It's coming to a close for me now, but there's no reason why someone can't pick this up and, and take it on. Maybe a team of people, I don't know. Um, I know that I'm very comfortable sitting and talking at a machine because like I've done uh, I've, I've done stuff on stage before as like a little actor or something. I, like I sing at karaoke, I'm, I'm singing a choir now. Um, I know that I've, I've got that kind of extroverted side of me that's quite happy doing this. Um, and I do realise that that's um, not a thing that is always present in, well, magic players, uh, especially judges. But someone out there can, can almost certainly take this on. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm being told that, hey, uh, making an audio rule book is going to be quite difficult because we'll change so often that it would require re-recording nearly every six months. It's very true. Um, so, I'm done. That's me going up on the shelf as somebody who used to be a pretty good magic judge, but isn't going to be active anymore. Um, yes, it's sad, but I, I've got other things to do. I'm really looking forward to them. Um, I think my family will enjoy having me back for a bit they'll probably get bored of me try and kick me off the island again or something but um thank you very much for everybody who's been a part of my magic um experience uh i hope i've helped some of you out but this is the end of episode 19 and this is the end of magic the judging stream as we know it thank you everybody for tuning in bye bye